thank you for coming. I'm Scott Walters, Scrotty. Um, this is the, the 2600 Junior, like uh, 15 years after they started making it, uh, they, they made this little small thing and started selling it for $50. So how many of you had a, an Atari 2600 when you were growing up? Awesome. OK, I think there's a, there's a sample bias here. I think we got some selection bias. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming. So people, th this thing is famous for its graphics and not in a good way. Um, so I kind of, I, <laughs> I want to I get a handle on what people think is actually in this, what's happening here. So how much memory does this thing have? Um, who thinks it has more than a megabyte? <laughs> okay, what about, uh, what about uh, 128K? Who thinks it has more than 128K? 1K? More than 1K? Okay, we got a few takers for that. Um, those of you who think it has less than 1K, how much memory do you think this thing has? Uh, 512. 512. Bytes. Right. Any other guesses? 128. 128. We have a winner. Ladies and gentlemen, this thing has 128 bytes of memory. <laughs> so the, the memory is actually on a, a off-the-shelf part. The uh, It's called the... PIA, the uh, hardware interface that connects to the switches, also has a hardware timer on it, uh, and it has um, and it has memory baked in, static memory. So, um, all right, this was the first computer that I had. Actually, not this exact model, but Atari's 8-bit home computers. They came well after the 2600. They they inherited uh, some of the hardware. Um, so my my exposure was was kind of this 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 Atari thing, and I was always curious about the 2600. After that, um, later got a 130XE. So the books back in the day that I'm learning from, they're, they're really trippy. They look like this. And uh, <laughs> does that make you want to learn to program, be a superhero? And that, that uh, yeah, maybe. Anyway. Um, so I also had a had Amiga later, and it turned out by some some coincidence, the same guy J Minor designed uh, was with a, the chief designer for the chips and all of these machines, um, <laughs> starting with the, the 2600, the Epic computer, and the Amiga, and then I went uh, straight to Linux and skipped Windows. Um, so there's a huge there's this was Atari's first uh, first commercial product, Pong. Um, they put it in arcades, and then they started selling them at home, and this was a huge deal at the time. People were really excited about that, and then they they started selling the VCS, and they're you know, Really excited about that too. Um, the uh, the Pong unit was not a, a computer. They they built it out of seventy four thousand series or something like that. Logic, so little NAND gates and latches and inverters and buffers and stuff like that. So there's no processor in it. So all it did was play Pong. And there's a whole bunch of clones that did nothing but play Pong. Uh, and they they kept making machines like this for the arcade and. Uh, then eventually they decided they wanted to bring a home, but they couldn't just bring all the, the logic in, so they, they had to make something flexible enough to play these that, uh, that had, uh, uh, well, they had to put a computer in it. Um, so uh, Mario first appeared on this, but not in Mario Brothers. He first appeared in Donkey Kong. Um, for those of you who, who aren't familiar, there's, there's some history here. Um, so... This thing, the Atari 2600 came out the same year. The, the original ones are way bigger than this one. The original one came out in 1975. Um, and that was the same year that the Apple II came out. Um, Atari wanted to introduce a $200 system, which is $870 in today's, today's money. Had to play all their arcade hits. Um, and <laughs> this, this thing came onto the, the market costing $1,300 without a disc or monitor. And it had 4K memory. Um, so they're trying to make something that costs a, a sixth of what, less than a sixth of what this thing does. Um, and uh, the, this is what they are up against. This is what, uh, what they're competing with graphics for. Um, so if the, if the 2600 is bad, it costs a sixth as much as this machine, and things aren't terrible shades of green and red, and they're not flickering quite that bad usually. <laughs> I want to I want to kind of build an appreciation for uh, for what they did here. So the, the design of the Atari 2600 is intimately designed, uh, intimately tied to the, to the design of the CRT. Um, <laughs> You have 192 scan lines. 
of picture display on your, your home NTSC cathode ray tube television. Broad, NTSC was a broadcast standard, uh, national television something, something. Um, so this is what stuff got transmitted over the air on in your rabbit ears picked up. So you had 192 lines of actual picture. This is the picture here, right there. Um, you had 192 lines of picture um, that were uh, across uh, <laughs> two, four, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's 240 resolution. Oh, uh, that's, uh, that's clock cycles. Um, so 240 pixels across and 192 scan lines high. Um, so <laughs> that's, uh, I was getting ahead of myself. <laughs> So you're you're trying to you're trying to you're trying to build something cheaper than the the the, uh, the Apple II. So what what do you do? How how can you make a device cheaper? What's the general strategy for doing that? You move logic to software. So we'll come back to that in a minute here. Um, the the processor has. Uh, <laughs> When you're when you're writing code for this thing, <laughs> I'm losing a losing a little bit here. There's uh, some store A instructions. Um, this is what it looks like in code to write to a hardware register. That's what it looks like to uh, to write to a memory location. It's the exact same instruction, just writing to different addresses. Uh, this is the color palette of the thing. You have 128 colors. Um, these are the features that the video hardware has. You can tell the processor to wait until the scan line is at the beginning. The, the process, tell the thing to make the processor wait until the scan line is at the very beginning of a scan line, or the, the beam. Oh, the, so the cathode ray tube, um, you have this, uh, uh, you have this um, electron gun that gets aimed by magnets. So it's drawing one dot at a time and scanning left to right, left to right, top to bottom. Um, so when the cathode ray is, uh, tube is starting the scan line, uh, the weight sink will release the processor and let it run again. Uh, v blank, the processor sends signal through the, the, the television hardware by way, of, um, by way of this memory address to uh, tell the processor to start moving the beam from the bottom back up to the top again. That's done in software. You have to control this. Um, so you have to enable vertical blank during uh, When you hit here for uh, for 37 lines, you're uh, you're telling the processor to uh, move, start moving the scan line back to the top of the screen or the the TV. Otherwise, it won't do it itself. Um, your you have play field registers 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, PF0 only has four bits in it. PF1 has eight bits. PF2. Um, so the, the left side of your screen and the right side of your screen each have 20 bits of, of play field data. This is the background that gets drawn when you see a game. Um, so the left side of the screen is either mirrored or repeated on the right hand side of the screen. So you get either the same data again or else you get the mirror image of it. And the processor writes to these registers every scan line that it wants to change what appears on that scan line. So you've got 76 machine cycles. And you can spend them updating the background registers. Um, you can change the size of the ball. You've got three different kinds of objects. You have player, the two player objects, um, which are movable 8-bit wide things that you can change the position of on the scan line. You've got 40 or 20 bits of background data that mirror and repeat. You have three 1-bit wide objects. You've got a missile and a ball, or two missiles and a ball. Um, you can repeat the players. You can have three players. Um, for kind of a space invaders thing. Um, you can make them quad size or double size. Um, you can have two players spaced out. Um, you don't get to tell it where to draw the player at the point where the processor, the, the scan line is at the place where you want the processor to be. Uh, the processor saves to that memory location there and it moves the player there. So you have to, um, the theme of this is you have to count the number of cycles. You have to know how long each instruction takes and where exactly where the electron beam is at that point. Um, 
there's a way to move uh, the players relative where they are up to uh, uh, seven or eight places left or right where they are. Um, which, is, uh, which is that. You store how much you want to move the players and you bang another memory address. Um, you can enable, disable the graphics. You can store video data uh, for the players. You have eight bits for two different movable objects. You have, uh, you can set the play field to repeat or mirror. Um, you can delay the graphics updating in the players. You can change um, colors of the two different players individually, the background and the foreground. Um, and you have two audio registers. Now given all of that, what was involved in making this right here? What, what registers do they have to, to use? What's going on here? What is the processor spending its time doing? Do I have any volunteers to, uh, to, to reverse engineer this? <laughs> so what, what's some of the registers that are being used here? This is, a, this is the pack-in. This is the, the tank combat game. You, sir. It's using the two player registers to draw the numbers top right. Um, actually, it's using a feature where um, it's drawing that using the background uh, pattern data, but you can set them to uh, match the players. And the left side will be player one, and the right side will be player two. But thank you. Excellent guess. Um, so this is, uh, this is the 20 bits background data right here that's mirrored from one side to the other side. Every scan line, uh, they update the background data. Or maybe every eight scan lines, they update the background data. Um, at this point here, they tell it to start drawing the, the first player, um, probably before the screen started drawing. Now, this, remember, this is as the scan line's going uh, left to right and top to bottom. Um, the processor is, is updating these registers in real time, 60 times a second. Um, so here they, they started loading different data each, uh, each couple of scan lines into this player. Here they started doing the same thing for this one. They probably checked every scan line rather they needed to store data in there. Um, and then when they get to the bottom, there's a bit of a reprieve. The thing can, uh, thing can do some game logic for about 30% of the time. I'm going to show some more games here and see if we can get some theories on it. Exactly what's going on. Does anyone have any favorites? I've got Solaris is good, Space Invaders, Donkey Kong, Joust. Actually, my the Indiana Jones. <laughs> Let's see if this works. See, this is what I do at home. I've uh, I've just got a got a monitor and uh, I just plug the, the 2600 into it care of this thing. So where are these like USB drives or what? <laughs> So the, the particular processor in the 2600, so stop me at any point if you have any questions. Um, it's a 6507, so it's a version of the 6502 that has most of the address line, or a lot of the address lines cut off. So it can address 4K or uh, 8K of memory totally. The carts usually have 4K on them. I think I'll give this a minute. If I can't get it to work, I'll just have to give up. I lugged this thing a long way to, to plug this in. All right, I think I, I think I got to give up and just go on emulation. I apologize. I'll try again if I have time left over in the unlikely event. Emulator. What do they have to do to get this thing to work? What's going on here? Now we've got two. We've got two sprites, and we can change the color on them every line. 
and we can change the pattern data on them every line. They're both probably in that scan line, but what's going on here? We've got a lot more than two sprites. These two. Yes, yeah, it's sharing one between there. So it can multiplex them. You can have at least two more if you update hard registers and reposition them. But at any given scan line, you can have two if you have enough cycles to update all the registers. <laughs> So the 6502 was also used in Bender, uh, the <laughs> Terminator Android. It was used in the Apple II, the Commodore 64. Um, all, all, sorts of, all sorts of things had this in it, um, the Atari 8-bit home computers. Uh, this, is, uh, this is combat right here, disassembled and graphed. Um, this is what 6502 assembly looks like if you zoom way, way out. Um, so the stuff here, they, they decompiled into instructions. They're too small to see. Um, but where, it's, where there's graphics, 8-bit graphic in there, uh, they, uh, they have it decoded as graphic. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I, <laughs> that effect should not be on. <laughs> Okay, so this is the this is the syntax of 6502 assembly. So if you want to program the process or anything, and you do otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Um, the syntax for the language is the label starts in the in the first column, um, and then the three letter opcode name, and then any operands to it, uh, commas or semicolons indicate a comment, and then comments after the semicolon. Um, so here's the the add with carry instruction. There's not an add without carry instruction, so they name the one add instruction ADC. Um, so there's a few different flavors of this. The first one is you're adding an immediate value. Just whatever is in the accumulator, um, the A register, you add one to it. Um, the pound sign means that you're just adding that number. Otherwise, you're adding to a memory address. Whatever value is in the memory address, 99. Um, the X register can be used to index it. So you add X to 99 and then add to whatever's in that memory location. Um, now, the 6502 has a, has a special feature that's really useful for the Atari 2600 um, because all the hardware registers are, are in the first 256 bytes of memory, in the first uh, addressable by one byte. Um, so there's an addressing mode that lets you address things with only one byte that are addressable in the first byte of memory. So all of the, all of the RAM and all of the hardware registers, um, except for the, in a, the IO stuff, um, you can address with one byte of memory. So you have one byte for the add instruction, and then one byte for uh, which memory address, which is 99. So this is two bytes right here. Uh, this is three bytes in your program. That's also three bytes. This adds x to a 16-bit number, um, goes to that memory address, adds whatever there. This is indirect. It looks in, it computes a memory address, matches the memory address at the memory address, and then goes out to that address. Um, and this stuff is really handy for doing table stuff. Usually you just use the first uh, 99 comma x and you just have a, a table of 256 up. So this is all of the instructions in the C2502 processor. You've got break, which uh, gives it a non maskable interrupt, which jumps through an interrupt vector and calls an operating system which does not exist in this thing. Um, you can branch if the last operation resulted in a positive number. You can jump to a subroutine. This thing has a stack too. You can jump to a subroutine and it pushes the address to a stack. You have to save your, your own registers. You can branch if the last computation resulted in a negative number. You can return from an interrupt, which is break as an interrupt. Um, this thing doesn't have interrupt logic hooked up, so you can't use that. The real 6502 does. 6507 strip that off. You can return from a subroutine. Um, the code that I'm going to show you here doesn't use any subroutines because I can't spare the memory. Um, overflow flag is set. Carry is clear. Um, you can branch. All the instructions start with B or branches. You can load data into the Y register. You have three registers, Y register, X register, A register. Uh, the X and Y registers, all you can do is increment, deincrement them, and save them and compare them to other numbers and use them as indexes on other loads, stores, and additions. Otherwise, you really only have one register, the A register. Um, you can compare a value. You can branch if the last operation is non-zero. Um, you can compare X to something. You can branch if the last operation was equal. You can do bitwise tests on something, store Y, load Y uh, in different, different addressing modes, kind of index by X. You can push uh, the processor uh, flags. 
and then pull them again. You can clear different flags, such as the carry flag and uh, interrupt flag. You can transfer uh, data between different registers as long as you're transferring it through the, the A register. Um, you can increment and decrement Y, um, shift values left and right, um, jump to different locations. Um, you can do exclusive or and and uh, or logic operations, um, subtract, um, more bit shifting stuff, and that's the only things you can do. This is this is what the processor does. Um, so, but there's also some legal instructions that kind of happen because. Um, it's wired up so that when it sees different bit patterns coming in, it enables different bits of logic and stuff like that. So all of these things are two different things happening at the same time. Um, and people pre creating games for this thing will, will use these in strategic locations, such as uh, um, decrement the contents of a memory location and then compare the results with the A register. That's fantastic. Load two address or two uh, registers at the same time. Completely. They, they didn't even put these in the manual. So um, TIA processor, this is what Joust in the arcade look like. Um, this is a, what uh, someone made a, a game called Joust Pong, where you flap up and down. And I was, <laughs> I loved Joust as a kid. It, so you, your, your little paddles are flapping. I can, I can demonstrate at the, uh, the end here. Um, I get out of the slide software. So I, I loved Joust as a kid, and I was, I was always inspired by it. And I, I had this idea for the Atari 2600, you, you can't really do very much 3D stuff because you need a frame buffer to do that. And then you have to buy an Apple II or something really expensive like that, which no one could afford. But what if you use the 128 bytes of memory as a sort of primitive frame buffer? Obviously, you, know, you can't, can't really have a, 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 very much resolution. In fact, you only have Y resolution. Here's someone made Flappy the Bird for the, for the Atari 2600. I was, I also found this inspirational. Um, so I, I started calling this the floor is made of lava, but I haven't added the lava yet. Um, hey, let's look at some games. <laughs> Shit. I think there's a, I think there's a two player mode, but oh, and it engages automatically. That's brilliant. So using two players, three player. I don't know how they're doing that. I think Stella has a, the, the 2600 emulator has a mode where it uh, smooths over the flicker for you. <laughs> so you can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> People also write demos for it, just to try and show off what they can do with the hardware. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you have to update stuff constantly, so it's not like you can take your time updating it. Um, so yeah, just, just trying, to, trying to push the thing to its limit. People do stuff like that. So, oh yeah, I should I should show you my my stupid game that I've been working on. Because we're gonna look at a lot of code. That's the enemy bird. He's kind of ugly. He'll follow us around though. So I've got these these platforms. All the data is is just on the Y data. I'm I'm using about 100 bytes of of the total memory. Uh, to draw a frame buffer about what color the platform is and how wide it is. You'll never have one piece of platform drawn in front of another one because um, uh, it'll always be occluded. When you go off the end of the, the level, it comes back around again. Um, the thing spends all of the time where it's not actually drawing the platforms, trying to, trying to do some math. And I'll, I'll walk you through that here. So you can all learn 6502 assembly programming. You can land on the platforms. You can bounce off of them. You can fail to land on them. You can hit your head on them. Does, 
I've been staring at this a long time. Does that make any visual sense to anyone? Can anyone have, <laughs> does anyone have any concept of what's going on there? <laughs> or does it, it look like a music visualization thing? <laughs> Yeah, I would be I would be jousting if I haven't coded that yet. So um, the the first thing that you have to do when you implement a game is you need to have smooth momentum. You can't be jumping like Mario where you either go straight up or you go straight at an angle. I mean the the, the Atari Mario, they fixed that for the Nintendo. So um I have 8-bit sign data for speed for Z and Y. You have low bytes um, that are basically the fraction, the decimal part of the number. Then you have whole ones. Um, so every frame, I add the 8-bit signed speed into uh, the 8-bit spined low. And if it carries, and then I either subtract one or add from player Z. Um, same thing with Y. So I'm, I'm moving in two dimensions here, forward and up and down. And uh, <laughs> let me just fix that. So, you know, last minute, uh, last minute changes to the slides are never a good idea. <laughs> That's a terrible font, too. It doesn't even matter if you can, you can read this, but uh, loading the player's speed, branching minus. Uh, to momentum one, which is here, um, if it's a negative value. This handles a negative case. That handles the positive case. Um, clear carry. Uh, add with carry the player's low indexed by x, because this loops over all the two movable objects, which is you and the one other enemy bird. Every enemy bird that you add takes six bytes of memory, which takes six lines away from the, the frame buffer display. Um, if overflow is clear and then it exits, otherwise it adds one uh, to the player's x and then it jumps down here. That's the same thing, but it subtracts one if it if it overflows the other direction. So that's that's my implementation of momentum. Slightly more readable font. So uh, this is uh, this is 3D rotation. Basically, you uh, take you take a point um, in in um, Cartesian space, x y coordinates, and you convert it to polar space, uh, and then you convert it back again. So um, the 6502 processor does not do multiplication. The code to do multiplication would fill up the screen. It would be worse than the last thing that I showed you. Um, Cosine and cosine was that listed among the operations when I was when I was going through all the operations was that in there? No. Did anyone happen to catch that? So I don't do that. This is a this is the perspective function. I don't I don't do that either. Um, <laughs> I have I have three three main functions here, and they're not really functions because they're it's just inline code. There's no there's no subroutine calls and return because that would use two bytes of stack memory, and I can't spare that because I want every byte that I can for my stupid frame buffer. So I'm computing an arc tangent and a hypotenuse, and I'm plotting it on the screen. But the tables. Remember the uh, the load instruction that indexes by another register? Everything's in tables. I computed the tables with Perl. This is Perl use number one. This is what the table looks like. Um, arc tangent is adjusted by, um, rather than using 360 degrees or radians or something like that, um, it's restricted to the player's view. So it's just, um, oh, and it's, uh, it's busted. Since it's a ratio of two different numbers, um, one of them goes one direction and it goes another direction. This is the high four bits that goes this way and the low four bits that go that way. So I take the, uh, I take the uh, delta between um, how far away the, the enemy is and how much he is up and down, um, take the absolute value of those, adjust negatives later, um, and then make that into one byte. And then I adjust the, address the entire table with one byte. And then boom, instantly, three cycles later, I have the arc tangent. So why should you do a bunch of, a bunch of math when you can just index a table? Uh, this is uh, this is the code that does that. It combines things together. It, it, yeah. <laughs> so this is on GitHub. <laughs> this is the uh, this is use of Perl number two. Now, who thinks it's fun to debug 6502 assembly, or who thinks that sounds like a lot of fun? <laughs> I, I agree, but um, what I found really fun was Acme 6502. 
first you load the binaries in, which I, I just showed you, uh, newbies.bin, um, using the CPU load from after I create my CPU object with Acme 6502 new. Um, and then I run it with this callback. Um, every time I get the callback, uh, I look at my, and I have the symbols module um, that parses the assembler uh, output, the assembler listing uh, from when you assemble the, the code, you, uh, you compile it from the uh, text into the actual binary um, in the, the simple assembler format. It tells you the memory address of everything that you've declared. Um, so I parse that and I have an object that knows where everything is. Um, and then when the processor, uh, the, where the processor makes it to, the program counter and the processor, which is the current instruction that's executing, um, hits where I want it to, and then I use Padwalker to uh, go into Acme's, uh, Acme 6502's um, internal variable IC and set it to zero so it doesn't iterate anymore and stops iteration and exits back out. I could have done that with die too, but I did it that way. Um, and then I pick out of memory uh, the view address, wherever that is. I compute the size of view. View is my little frame buffer of things. Um, and then I can run tests like uh, I can write into the current platform and the last line that it rendered, um, I'm using FF as negative. Um, the expected width of the platform, I can compute using the perspective table. Um, the expected color, I can read uh, data for level zero and find out what the color is supposed to be for level zero. Um, I can position the player somewhere. Um, I can check that the line is blank, um, run the CPU, and then I access memory again, use CPU read eight to read eight bits of data and make sure that the line, the upper three bits of every of all of my frame buffer data uh, tells the color to draw, the lower five bits is the width of the line to draw there. So all of that beautiful flying around in that gorgeous 3D universe is just each line, eight bits of data, platform width and platform color. Um, so <laughs> enemy, enemy bird is, <laughs> enemy bird is, uh, the hypotenuse of this right triangle away um, from the distance of up and down and, and distance left and right. Um, does it matter? More unit tests, just making sure that uh, I render a line. I have no idea what's going on. So yeah, I, I tell it to, to render a line and then I uh, set what the delta is and I make sure that the value that comes back out um, from uh, computing. Yeah, I have no idea. I can't read this, can you? <laughs> one, <laughs> one, so when you're, when you're drawing things uh, left to right on the screen, you, you can't, you, you, the processor runs everything, so you can't just run functions. So you have to constantly check that you don't need to be doing something. And in this case, you have 64 cycles between that when you're using one of the built-in timers. Um, so this is my drawing code. Um, there's two different versions. I have it unrolled going up and going down. I can um, load the data that's currently in the frame buffer, pull off the bottom five bits, make sure that what I'm drawing is wider than that. If not, I skip it. Um, otherwise, um, I stuff the new data back in there, the color and the new width. Um, and then before I do anything else, I load the hardware timer, make sure that it's not zero, if it is zero, and then I have this macro here, the, uh, the assembler lets you reuse pieces of code and just stuff them right straight in, just macro expansion. Um, so I handle vertical sync logic in line in this loop and then branch back up to the top. There's uh, three different times I get to set the timer. So that's tedious, having to, having to make sure that you're not running out of time all the, all the time. So obviously what you want to do So obviously what you want to do is write Right, unit tests. So I have a table of how long each instruction takes, and uh, in my callback from Acme 6502 CPU, I can keep a tally and I can return the tally so I know how much CPU time I have available so I can write unit tests for my 6502 code, 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 make sure I don't go over. 
if uh, the number of cycles used is less than available, the test passes and everyone's happy. But uh, unfortunately, one of the limitations of Acme 6252 is it just provides RAM. It doesn't provide hardware. Um, doesn't have support for hardware emulation hooks. So sorry, a mapped I.O. Is, is out of the question if someone fixes it. So um, here we have package register TIM 64T, which is the uh, 64 clock timer. Every time 64 clocks pass, it counts down one. It, you can start it up to 255, and it goes down. Um, so we've got this global variable here, um, cycles. Uh, and uh, in the, the CPU callback, I continue to, to increment that. So I have this implementation of a tied scaler. Um, when you store a value to it, um, the 64T, it sets that many cycles left. When you read int IM, which tells you uh, how many chunks of 64 cycles you have left, computes it and returns it. And then I just tie those into Acme 6502's object in the memory array um, at the location um, according to the assembler listing that that's supposed to be at, um, provide that class name. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, Perl's tied interface, it lets you um, run logic when you read from a variable or write from a variable. And Acme 6502's memory space is just implemented as an array of, of scalars. And then I can write a unit test that <coughs> I can write a unit test that makes sure that uh, I did not run out of time and I ran out of time. I'm going to run out of time. <laughs> okay, in this case, I ran out of that address. So this is the the display kernel um, when the when we're in this box. It looks like right here where we're actually drawing. There's some time before the scan line gets to the visible picture area, and then it goes back again. Um, and then there's time when it's not drawing. So you have to count cycles then, too. So I know I, know I need to burn exactly uh, 76 cycles. So you have to add up all of your instructions. This is what it winds up looking like. Um, I update the color of the foreground. Um, I load from a table of background colors stored in the background. Um, I do a lookup on uh, the three different registers or, uh, from three different tables that give me data for the three different uh, registers um, for the background pattern data that gets reflected. Um, I figure out which scan. I load the scan line into the Y register, load both A and X with my frame buffer. Um, so get the current line of frame buffer for that. Um, get the platform color. Um, given that, I use uh, the entire uh, 8 bits of data and just have replicated stuff in there. Um, that tells me what color the, the platform is supposed to be. Um, there's a special color that indicates that I need to draw the enemy sprite. I go off and do that in a different direction if that's what happens. Um, otherwise, I pick off the bottom five bits. Um, use that. I stuff that in A. Fetch. Uh, the scan line, add in whatever sky. Um, I actually have some no op instructions, so I can waste some time. Decrement the scan line if it's still positive. I go back and do it again. So the idea is, you you don't want to update any registers um, while the picture is being drawn, unless you want it to change at that point. Um, if you update it halfway through it being drawn, it'll flicker. So I update most of the registers before stuff's being drawn, and then compute what it's going to be and save it away in registers in the, in the meantime. Um, here's some, uh, now every year a couple of, of homebrew comes out and people have, have done just some really amazing things with the, the, the Atari 2600. Um, and this is one of the things that someone did. It's, um, so when you have a processor and it's running program out of ROM, the, the general operation is it fetches the next byte of instruction, and if the instruction tells it to fetch memory from the ROM, it reads it from the ROM, and then it maybe it reads another instruction that tells it to store somewhere. Um, so some very clever chap had the idea that uh, when the processor is storing zeros on, on the bus to some certain address, you don't necessarily have to have ROM in your ROM. You can have logic 
that manipulates the bus. So you have your 6502, which is doing its 6502 thing, but you also have another processor, some other hardware. And actually, this goes back to Pitfall. Pitfall had a simple version of this in it. Um, so while your, your thing is sitting here making reads and writes to memory, this thing is interfering with the bus, and it's stuffing different data on the bus. If you're just doing a load zero, it can pull from tables, or it can compute different values, or it can whatever. This thing has an ARM processor in it. So you can double the amount of stuff that you're able to get on one line. Uh, the yeah, I think I've I think I've got some somewhere. How am I doing on time here? Awesome! Wow. So that's, that's pushing data through the Atari 2600 bus twice as fast as if it was just the 6502 loading from ROM. If it loads zero and just saves to the different addresses, um, and this cartridge magically stuffs the correct data on the bus to update the registers, um, rather than doing a six cycle load and a, and a, or a three cycle load and a three cycle store, you just keep doing a three cycle store over again. Um, you just have to store to the correct address and then boom, the right data magically appears out of nowhere and goes to that address. Um, I'll leave you guys one last thing here, if I can find it. Probably should have been a slide since I have a little extra time. <laughs> Deal meal was supposed to be a reference to a counting your cycles and trying to figure out exactly what you had. <coughs> oh yeah, it's 52% uh, assembly and 38% Perl. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll show you my... Uh, my, my unit tests here. There's a lot of them. Okay. So I'm sure you guys thought that this is what I was going to present here, just porting Perl to the, the 2600. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, you want that, right? I mean, that would be kind of cool, right? So like if we have... Um, my j equals 0, for i equals 1 to 10, my k equals not i, and j plus equals k. And then you know, you'd be able to like turn that into 6502 assembly, or you load a, store it in 0, load 1, stick it in i, increment i, load i. Mm -hmm. 
no, I'm not going to write something that translates Perl to 65 to assembly. That's crazy. So um, <laughs> if anyone wants to Kickstarter this, I'll, uh, I'll finish it and I'll start implementing regexes and uh, <laughs> maybe some file I.O. I'm not sure how that would work. Um, so one cool nit, uh, the uh, joystick ports are uh, bidirectional. You can set whether data is coming in or coming out. Um, it's also the first CD system. They uh, they sold this thing. It loaded games from tapes, but then they uh, then they released uh, they released all of them on a CD. So maybe that makes it the world's first uh, CD system. So, <laughs> is there anything that can be clarified from that? <laughs> you sir. Oh, three minutes. All right, thank you. Anyone? I have written notes that you had on the slide. Is that something you wrote? Or the notes on the slide? Oh yeah, I just yeah, I just drew them on there. Yeah. Uh, is it? Yeah, I'm curious. It's pretty much everybody. Um, I don't do any of this, so that's why I take a look at all this. Uh huh. Um, is pretty much everybody programming six five zero two assembly like C compilers? I've done a bit of that, like Arduino and whatnot. So besides the besides the Perl compiler. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, of course. Well, obviously, I mean, most people program the thing in uh, most people program the thing in basic. And why are you guys sitting through an assembly class? Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I should show you that. So, um, well. If you wanted to write portal, and then it might look something like. I'm afraid to ask, but what text editor do you use? VI. Oh, yeah. oh, your term. Yeah. Uh, it's a pretty standard X term. So, yeah, someone made a. Someone made a, a, ba or a, a little basic interpreter, basic like uh, compiler um, that lets you draw the play fields out and use if levels greater than four and stuff like that. So someone totally. Uh, here. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, for, thank you for enduring an extremely hurried introduction to assembly language program that included me rattling off the names of instructions as quickly as I could. Thank you.